Hey, this is Evan Phillips from Anchorage, Alaska. You're listening to The Fern Line. Alaska, the highest concentration of big, remote mountains in North America. For generations, a unique group of climbers have tested themselves in these vast alpine arenas. The Chugach, St. Elias, the Hayes, Niacola, the Kachatnas, the Revelations. Their stories are etched on high alpine walls. Their visions follow lines of cold gray ice. What inspires them? What makes them come back? Who survives? Who suffers? These are the stories we'll tell on season one of the Fern Line. On today's episode, we'll get to know alpinist Clint Helander. Clint is widely known in the mountaineering world for his climbs in the Revelations, a striking group of peaks 100 miles west of Anchorage, near the southern tip of the Alaska Range. In addition to their remoteness, the Revs, as Clint refers to them, are notorious for their relentless storms, variable rock quality, and overall lack of exploration. Since his first trip to the Revs in 2008, Clint has climbed a number of classic first ascents there, up mountains that bear foreboding names like Golgotha, Mausolus, and the Apocalypse. I hope to get a deeper sense of Clint's adventures in the Revs when we sat down to talk in November 2016. But like most alpinists, I found out there was a lot more to Clint's story than just climbing mountains. Clint grew up in the shadow of Mount Rainier, just outside of Seattle, Washington. He had a good childhood, with many weekends spent skiing in the Cascades with his family. But after his parents divorced, things became more tense, especially between Clint and his mom. After graduating from high school, and with the conflicts between he and his mother coming to a head, Clint decided to leave home and start making his own way through life. But it wasn't until he came to Alaska during college that a chance encounter with a new group of friends would propel Clint toward a life in the mountains. Little did he know that along the way, he'd learn more about the relationships with his friends, and ultimately his mother, than he ever could have imagined. My time in Alaska was going to be one semester of college. And then I was going to go right back to my friend group that I knew was waiting for me in Washington at Washington State University. And uh, I was walking around the halls of UAA the first week of school, and I didn't know anybody, not a single person. I knew my dad and my uncle and my cousin who's older than me. <clears throat> and I saw this... Uh, this flyer for the outdoor club, and it said something about, come to the UAA Outdoor Club this Thursday at 9 at the Student Union. And so I show up there, and this first meeting, there's probably already 70 people in this little auditorium, and they have a, a raft set up, and people are just, I can tell these people are cool. And instantly, before I even talk to anybody, I want to be a part of it. 
And of course, they're just breaking all the rules of the school. You know, they they have beer and algaes and stuff like that on school property, and and they're uh, rappelling off the second story to get down there instead of taking the stairs. And the ladies who are working there are freaking out. And I'm like, this is some rad shit. This is <laughs> like this is the the people that I wanted to find when I came here. And uh, so, you know, the first week, and and at this point in time, I am not an outdoorsman at all. Like. I'm a skier, but that's about it. I, I actually hated hiking growing up. My parents bought me a backpack and they used to have to tether my wrist when I was a little child. We'd go hiking and I would just complain the whole way, like a dog that doesn't want to go on a walk. I would just complain and almost lay down. So now I meet this, uh, <laughs> this, <laughs> I meet this outdoor club and I just realized that these are some cool freaking people. And the first week we're going to go raft the Gulcana. And at this point, I have jeans. I don't have a sleeping bag. I don't have a freaking thing except for maybe, you know, a shitty Columbia jacket that I had growing up. And uh, so I talked to these guys. I'm like, I'd like to go. I don't, have, I don't have any gear. I don't have a sleeping bag or anything. And they're like, oh, don't worry about it, kid. We got you. Sweet. So my buddy picks me up or my my buddy, my new friend picks me up on Saturday morning. And sure enough, we're going out to Gulcana and we get all the way there. It's a beautiful day. And I see the guy who told me he would loan me some stuff. I'm like, hey, Sean, uh, I'm that new kid from Seattle. Can I have all my gear, my sleeping bag? And he goes, who are you? And so I don't have any gear for this three day rafting trip, literally nothing. And, um, of course, as soon as we get on the river, it starts raining and it rains like a bastard for two days. And I'm just soaked to the bone in my cotton t-shirts and not to mention, you know, it's a rafting trip with a bunch of college kids. We drank entirely way too much too. And, uh, so at the end of this trip, we all just had one of those crazy, we survived trips and it was totally miserable. But at the end, we're all like, what are we doing next week? And the next week we went to the Matanuska Glacier and ice climbed. And that to me was something so unbelievably foreign. I never in my wildest dreams as an urban child would I envision climbing ancient thousand year old blue ice and doing something like that for fun. And, uh, you know, midweek I'd gone rock climbing on the Seward Highway with these guys and, and it just shape my world. I was like, I think maybe when I put that harness on and even though I was just top roping, it was something like, this is what I'm, this is what I'm supposed to do with my life. After that first year of college, I was hooked and I wouldn't say that I was utterly hooked so much on Alaska yet, but the idea of, of climbing mountains. And I didn't really even know where I wanted to take it. I, I think I still was really heavily influenced by Washington at that point in time. And actually, stuff in Alaska was just too big. Denali was out of the question. Not even for the next five years, but for the next 30. It didn't even ent enter into my consciousness. And I knew that I wanted to climb Mount Rainier still because it had been this thing I'd looked at for my entire life in the Pacific Northwest. And so when I was 20, I... I'd done a little bit of climbing with my friends, all just day stuff, never really, nothing really technical yet. But um, I went and climbed Mount Rainier in March. I met some guy off CascadeClimbers.com and I met him in the parking lot. I was down for spring break. I was completely excited. I would actually bought some gear by this point in time. And yeah, we just went up there and summited. On, I think it was like March 23rd, so we just missed the winter ascent, but we had that mountain entirely to ourselves. We broke trail from the car to the trailhead, and then all the way up the trailhead to Camp Muir, and it was cold. And I look back on it now, and, and that experience was so much more Alaskan than so many of my Alaskan experiences was. But um, had I done it in June, it would have been an entirely different feeling, because there would have been hundreds of people, but here we were you know, 14,000 feet above my home 
in March and it was just this wild thing. It, it was that, it felt truly exploratory, even though it's a mountain that gets climbed thousands of times a year. After I climbed Mount Rainier and I started doing a little more rock climbing, I met some people here in Anchorage and we started trying to climb Mount Eucla. And in the Chugach, Mount Eucla is just this bad peak. It's only 7,400 feet tall or something, but it's got a 4,000, 4,500 foot tall face on it that is still unclimbed. But all around it are these other really challenging faces. And this uh, older guy, John Kelly, asked me if I wanted to go and try this climb with him. And, you know, here I can probably barely lead Water Ice 3 at this point in time. But he invites me on this climb and, you know, so we go up there with five days of food and we end up making the first ascent of this route. We called it Gangton Slade. And so I'd gone from never really, you know, mixed climbing before to on this route, he just gives me a rack of, of pins and peckers and, and all this crazy iron and he goes, here, just get up that seam. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, just bang them in, figure it out. So now I'm doing A2, you know, with a pack on, with crampons, learning how to aid, aid climb. And then we're doing these hanging bivvies with sleeping bags, like fully tied in with, you know, spin drift just falling on us all night and just shivering. And then the next day, he just gives me the lead. And he's like, here, do this pitch, you know. And we don't know if it's Water Ice 4 or Water Ice 6 up there. And, of course, I couldn't have gotten up Water Ice 6 at the time. But, you know, I led. And, and at the end of the climb, I felt like I'd really contributed. And, uh, you know, as a super young, inexperienced guy, I, I just had this learning curve that would have been unattainable for for me for it with any other way. But, um, during one of these little shivering bivvies we had, we're just laying there and, you know, we can still see the, the lights of Anchorage permeating above the Eagle, Eagle river skyline. And, you know, we were just talking about maybe that day's climbing and what tomorrow was going to bring. And I remember that he started telling me about other mountain ranges like the San Elias range. And then he told me about this range that nobody really had ever climbed in before called the Revelation Mountains. And I think it was after that that maybe I kind of remembered, oh yeah, you know, I think I've seen something about that in the guidebook or whatever. But after that climb, when I was just, you know, on fire within and wanted to find my own way, I just went and started researching the Revelations and there wasn't much. Inspired by his climb on Eucla, Clint dove headfirst into the world of alpine climbing and began researching the little-known mountain range that would shape the next decade of his life, the Revelations. Of particular interest to Clint was the unclimbed west face of Mount Mausolus, a 4,500-foot bastion of sweeping rock pillars split by a sinister runnel of gray water ice. Thus began a dream that would take many years of patience, hard work, and commitment to fulfill. But the biggest lessons would ultimately come from the partnership Clint shared with his good friend Seth. I pretty much just uh, tried to find a, a partner, and I found this guy Seth, who was a... Uh, a slightly older than me a guy in the outdoor club and you know we'd done a little bit of hiking together maybe but um, when I entered into this outdoor club you know these guys had already climbed El Capitan and they'd been up Denali and they'd done ski trips in the Alps you know so they were so much more experienced than me but as a, a 22 year old guy you know they were 
they were attainable and I could ask them questions and I could, you know, kind of get their information and, and glean off them. And, uh, I asked Seth to go to the revs with me and we were, I think we were both under 26 at the time. He certain, I certainly was. And we applied for a mountain fellowship fund grant from the American Alpine club. And we got 800 bucks, you know, but, uh, that's a lot of money when you're a dirt bag. When you're a little dirt bag guy <laughs> working at a cool outdoor shop, you know, making just above minimum wage. Yeah, that that <laughs> is huge. <laughs> and so um, we put in for the unclimbed west face of Mount Mausolus, which the peak altogether was unclimbed. But this was something that had really just infatuated me for a couple of years. I'd found out about it from... David Roberts' 1968 American Alpine Journal entry, in which he says, uh, on the flight in, we saw the hopeless labyrinth of Mount Mausolus, perhaps the toughest climb in the range. You know, just his incredibly visual, beautiful way of saying the hopeless labyrinth. I'm just like, I have to go check this thing out. And I just saw one or two photos of it, because even online, there wasn't much. And this was even before Google Earth was really popular. And... Uh, I just saw this one photo from a local pilot and it just showed this amazing 4,500 foot face with this perfect runnel of ice going all the way down. Perfect. And if this face was in Chamonix, it'd have 20 lines on it. As far as I knew, the West face had never even been attempted. And, um, I eventually figured out that, uh, that some guys in the mid nineties had made it to within like 400 feet of the summit on the east face but uh, they were there in, in June or maybe May and it got way too hot and when they were just near the summit these avalanches started coming down that just flowed like white water and they said that they were they felt lucky to have survived and they retreated so we put uh, we put a couple years of effort into getting up Mausolus and that was our first trip okay so so your first trip in there, you went in there with Seth. I went in there with Seth. Okay. Yeah, my first trip, I went with Seth. And what happened on that trip? Um, yeah, so we had this idea of landing a little bit northwest of Mausolus and then taking this pass over and uh, getting situated and trying the west face. And we got up there, and immediately that we found that that pass was kind of avalanche prone, so we abandoned it for that year. And we tried this beautiful unclimbed peak that was just right there. And we got about 10 pitches up the first time. And it was a slender ridge, rocky ridge. You know, we, uh, we brought food for three or four days. And we got about 10 pitches up and just realized that we need to kind of come down and, and figure it out. And we ended up making a, uh, the first ascent of this other little peak that was really, for all intents and purposes, just a steep hike, you know, a coolar. It could be skied by a really competent party. But, you know, even as a, as a 23-year-old climber, I had my first, first mountain ascent and had done it with uh, one of my heroes. And that meant a lot to me. And we went back and tried the ice pyramid. And we got pretty high. We got like 18 or 20 pitches up this time. And so I knew that next year we'd do the same thing and we were going to come back and warm up on the ice pyramid, tick off this classic ridge, and then we were going to go try mausolus and so uh, we came back in 2009 seth and i did we topped out on ice pyramid and this time we did it in like a, a two-day round trip you know so already we were learning and in the in the interim time in the winter we had tried to climb peak 11 300 in march so you know we were now this uh and we were doing a lot of climbing together we were both pretty committed to climbing in the revs and and ticking off these peaks together and yeah, we climbed the ice pyramid that year, but we still couldn't get to Mausolus. It was still kind of the same deal. We didn't really feel, feel good about the pass. And so after climbing the ice pyramid, we hiked and skied out 25 miles to this lodge. And the third year, we came back again for Mausolus. And we said, all right, this time we're going to just try and fly right to the base of it. You know, we're not going to mess with hauling loads and and... We're just going to completely commit to Mausolus or nothing. And, 
you know, I was still in college at the time, so I was kind of on a schedule and I couldn't just ditch class for weeks. So as soon as school was over, May 5th or whatever, I, I was out of there. And um, we got to the base. We got landed there. And at that point, I realized, holy shit, this thing is way bigger than anything I've ever climbed in my entire life. And it is so fucking steep and just terrifying. <laughs> and um, I didn't really feel ready for it. But, you know, we, we definitely... Uh, sat there and looked at it and it was getting pretty warm it was getting pretty warm in the day and so you know we just sat there and journaled about it and and talked and we eventually decided to go up one night and we had this wild idea that we could climb it in like a 24-hour push and then get to a safe spot during the day and just hide and let it get cold and then come all the way back down. So we wouldn't have those avalanches to deal with because by this point in time, <laughs> the, uh, the face was kind of coming alive with avalanches during the day. But we, we noticed this trend that every night it would just freeze and be completely quiet for 18 hours. And so we went up that night and we kind of climbed to like the point where if we kept climbing much more, we were going to be pretty committed. And we just had this talk and uh, Seth said, I don't really feel safe about this. Like, I don't really feel safe right now. And I go, I don't, we're not really safe right now. Like, we're probably flipping the coin even just being here. And so we rappelled and down climbed. And, you know, we were 2,000 feet up the face. And it was dawn. And we rappelled. And that day the avalanche started. And that night it didn't freeze. And we sat there in camp all night and just watched these absolutely monumental avalanches come down that chute. And that was one of those times when I realized, like, whoa, guy, like, you know what you're talking about enough, but you know just enough to really get yourself killed. You know, you, you have so much to learn. You need to really just, like, dial it back a little bit. You know, all that off season, I spent time uh, just kind of trying to get better about understanding avalanches and, um, you know, asking myself, you know, why am I climbing? Like, what am I doing? And, and how can I do this safely? Like, because, you know, I, I remember a thing in Mark Twight's book that, you know, the Shamanee cemetery is filled with the tombstones of 25 and 30 year old men. And I just realized I didn't want to be one of those guys. And so, uh, I just realized that to stay alive, I needed to be a, a more cautious climber and, and think about, you know, why would I even go in there at all when, when it was running with an avalanche? Like, why wouldn't I just stop and not even, you know, put it off until next year? So, um, we had this plan to come back in March, Seth and I did. And, uh, we're, you know, after that, that was kind of a hard trip for us because after that trip to Mausolus, we flew over to the Angel and we gave Robert's South Ridge a go. And we got, uh, we got about probably 15 pitches up this thing. And then that same warm weather, the same warm weather that was really dangerous for face climbing and climbing in coolars was incredible for climbing on a ridgeline, right? Because now we didn't have any objective hazard above us. And so we climbed um, about a third the way up the route. And then Seth just wasn't feeling it. And he wanted to go down. And I just could not understand what was going through his mind, but he just wasn't into it. There was other things in his life that were pulling him away. And uh, that kind of bothered us, like bothered me for a while. I, I didn't, uh, we didn't really talk for a couple months after that. But then in July, we started making plans to go back for the Angel in September or in late August, about the time that Roberts had had that good weather stretch you know, 45 years earlier. And uh, we were going to meet at this barbecue and talk it out. And like now after a month of really bad weather in the summer of 2010, the weather was just perfect. And it looked like it was going to be perfect for a long time. And I had, I had time off. I was good. And um, Seth never made it to this barbecue. I remember 
we were sitting there on this perfect night in Earthquake Park, and I'm just looking there, and I'm going, where's Seth? You know, and he wasn't answering his phone. And I saw this little smoke, little column of smoke rising across the inlet near Mount Susitna. And I thought, oh, you know, someone in a cabin's burning something over there or whatever. And then, you know, the sun is setting behind it. It's this beautiful night. And the uh, 212th Pararescue Pavehawk flies right over our heads and it's flying at attack that I knew it was on a mission. And I just said, something happened over there. And the next day I found out that Seth was dead and that that was his plane that had crashed. And it just like, it I couldn't believe it. One of the hardest parts about living is having to say goodbye to the people we love. The ability to face death head on and continue moving forward with grace is truly one of life's cruxes. Losing Seth was devastating for Clint. He hadn't just lost a climbing partner, he lost one of his best friends. But the ability to adapt, to weather adversity, to channel pain into creative energy, these are the traits of mountain climbers. It was with this mindset that Clint decided to head back to the Revs for one more shot at Mausolus. This time he'd fly into the mountains with his new partner, Scotty, and an iron will desire to succeed for Seth. So Scotty is, you know, first of all, it's kind of important to know Scotty a little bit. He's, uh, he's significantly older than me. He was at the time probably 34, and I was about 26. And, um, you know, he was a former Yosar guy, just a, a totally zany, wild guy, um, always, always making jokes. But, you know, free climb 5'10 plus 5'11 in the valley. Um, climbed in Pakistan, done all these wild things all over the world. And uh, it had a pretty insane life. And now he is going to nursing school. <laughs> so I convinced him to go along with me. And he was really instrument, instrumental in my life in the fact that he's like, Clint, if you want to be a good climber, you got to go to Yosemite. You know, years before, that's what I'd done. I'd gone to Yosemite. And... I went with him and, and I was really excited that he agreed to go with me and and we just flew in in a little super cub and I will never forget, again, just like flying in the year before with Seth, flying in with Scotty, now it's you know pretty much late winter, it's cold. And uh, we hadn't been able to secure a sat phone, in reaches weren't out by that point in time. Our pilot flew off and we felt really alone. But um, the weather had been good for several weeks, and we had nothing but a good forecast. And we didn't waste any time. We set up camp. We went to bed. I think we scoped the face for one day, and we left that night. And, um, yeah, we brought, you know, brought a double rack of cams, and I think we brought six ice screws, and we brought zero-degree bags because it was cold. And... We climbed up to Seth and Mai's high point, and then I pretty much knew that one of the cruxes of the route was going to come up pretty quick. And I came around this corner, and this thing that I thought was going to be potentially impenetrable just had this incredible ribbon of grade four water ice just going right around it, protection whenever I wanted. And um, so I, at this point, I'm just like, we've got this. I've got my water ice six rope gun following behind me and we're going to do this thing. We just have to, you know, be lucky with the weather and climb smart and, um, got a little bit higher. And then these rocks started falling when the sun was hitting the upper face. And it was pretty much the first time in my climbing life that 
I realized like I'm climbing something so steep that I kind of can't stop whenever I want to, you know, I can't just put a ledge up here and hang out and be safe. I'm like there's not even a flat spot to put the stove for like another 400 feet below me, you know? So how the hell are we going to hang here for 15 hours? And so I looked over and there was this, um, little gargoyle of snow and like a little tiny rounded rock. And I brought Scotty up. He crossed over there and he's like, it's going to have to do. And there was like a little overhang. And, and so sure enough, we made our hanging bivy there and we fully hanging bivied. I mean, <laughs> I had, I had my ass on a, on a flattened out bit of snow. And he was sitting there with his ice tool, like beating this rock apart. And, um, <laughs> I clove hitched my legs with the rope and just made this hammock. And he just sat there all night long talking in Borat speak. I was like, oh, it's so cold. So much <laughs> ass. I'm just like, this is fucking nuts. You know, and he's like, oh, Clint, you lack of the cold. You want the cold? <laughs> and, you know, but there was, that was uh, strangely calming to me, his erratic Borat impersonations that went on for weeks. In fact, he didn't really ever stop talking in Borat. But um, I knew that there was no question about going down. We were going up. And in the morning, you know, we'd, we had expected that on the climb we were going to be putting in tons of rock gear because it's this really narrow vein of ice uh, that just cuts these massive protruding walls. But um, we were not really finding any rock pro. The rock is just so compact in the inner bits of this mountain that it was pretty much ice or maybe like a pin here and there. And so we pretty much left most of our rock rack. I think we brought five or six cams and, and all of our pins. And, and now we're fully in ice. It's nothing but ice. And we left our sleeping bags here and everything. And it was a push for the summit. And so we were swapping leads and it just so happened that, uh, the steepest pitch as we're getting near it, it's just starting to loom overhead and it just looks like this, you know, upper jaw of this beast about to close down on us, just hanging and, and just this ferocious looking piece of ice. And, um, in my head, I'm just thinking like, Oh my God, like, I don't know if I'm good enough to climb this thing. And we have six ice screws. We had grossly underestimated, how many ice screws we needed because we thought we'd have ample rock pro. So, you know, these really hard pitches of ice are falling pretty much. We, we have to run them out. There's just no way around it, you know, unless we did like 40 foot pitches. So we're building a V thread and then belaying off one ice screw, equalizing them. Both tools hammered into the hilt equalized, fully hanging belays. And, uh, pretty much just having to run it out 40 feet. And there was a moment there when I was leading one of the crux pitches and I just felt like I had this transcendence in my life where I looked down and the last screw was 30 or 35 feet below me. And I look up and it's just more of the same for another 150 feet. And I wasn't afraid. I mean, this is like the hardest ice that I probably ever climbed in my life up until this point. And I'm climbing at 3000 feet up an unclimbed route. Um, and I would just, I was just calm. I was like, all you got to do is keep your picks in, keep your picks in, watch your feet, you know, go another 10 feet, put a screw in. And then I'd repeat the process. And when I'm thinking about this, I'm like, I'm going to fall 90 feet before that screw even rips out. And it was just, uh, it was a calming. I was calm. And it was one of those few points in your life. I mean, people talk about reaching a headspace. What's it called? The flow space where people are just, you're just in the moment and you reach like a, a perfection. And I felt like that was maybe one of only a handful of times when I was like at a, a moment of my own little perfection there. Like I, I knew I wasn't going to fall. It was almost like it must've been what soloists feel because I just knew I wasn't going to fall and got up to the belay. Like hammered both my tools in, made a V-thread, equalized it with a screw. And I remember Scotty coming up and he had the heavy pack. I mean, the poor guy was suffering because he had, he had most of the weight. And the picks of his crampon points are only going in like a third the way. And he was just looking up at me like, keep me tight. <laughs> and, 
And either way, yeah, so he, um, after that, the angle eased off, and now it's getting to be in the evening, and we, uh, we ended up climbing to the summit, and we didn't have any, any pickets or anything like that, but it was 400 feet of 60 or 65 degree snow, and I just thought, well, we can't protect it. Should we unrope? And he goes, no, nah, man, I trust you. Just don't fall. And that, uh, that act of simul climbing to the summit together roped up, knowing we didn't have any pro, that was one of those things like, wow, like this is what true partnership is. Uh, complete and utter trust. And uh, when we summited, it was just an unbelievable evening. I opened up my backpack and took out a little package and put Seth's ashes on the summit. And to me, that that still is probably the best moment of my life. You know, the climbing was phenomenal, but um, it was just really weird because when he'd been alive, we'd been sitting at the base, and you know, as climbers do, we mused about, oh, what are we gonna find up there? What are we gonna, what's it gonna be like? What should we name our route when we climb it? And we came up with the idea of the mausoleum, a tomb for the dead on Mount Mausolus, right? And you know, putting Seth up there, just letting him go in this very gentle summit breeze and knowing that he'll be there forever was unbelievably powerful. You gotta leave those goodbye blues People come and people go Yeah, you've lost some friends Well, you cheated and you stole even lost some bets Oh, but learning don't come easy Sometimes you gotta lose Take what you can get And leave those goodbye blues Climbing Mausolus became a benchmark in Clint's life. Not only had he found a way to the summit, He'd also learned about the value of friendships in the mountains. But he also learned a lot about himself, and this led Clint to start repairing the broken relationships in his family. After watching his mom battle through cancer and ultimately beat it, Clint decided it was time to bury the resentments from his childhood and start over. Over the next year, Clint and his mom started talking more, eventually going skiing together, just like the old days. It took a lot of work, but over time, they learned to forgive each other. They became a family again. But during a trip to Patagonia in the winter of 2012, Clint received a message from his mom that put everything into perspective. I'll never forget. I was in, I was going to Patagonia. I'd just been on a six month rock climbing trip. I'd seen her on the way down and then I'd spent Christmas with her. And then it, right after that, I was going to Patagonia. And it was uh, when I was there in Patagonia that I got the news that she had cancer that this time was terminal. Like it was pretty apparent. There wasn't, uh, there wasn't any coming out of this, this one. And so, um, you know, I saw her again after Patagonia and, and then I made several trips down to uh, see her again. And she came up and would, I mean, she skied with me when she had terminal cancer, you know, (laughs) up in Alaska. And that was just an amazing thing. And it was one of those times, Hey, we're just having fun. You know, now we're, now we're old buddies. We'd worked out all of our stuff and You know, I spent, uh, it was 2013 when she was pretty much on her, on her deathbed. But, you know, for years I had always thought that I got all of my outdoorsy stuff and my creativity and my independence from my dad. 
But over the years, as I was, you know, doing some internal reflection, I realized that, uh, that a lot of those really positive traits came from my mom. You know, that, that helped me to understand her more when I realized I'm like, you know, it's not that we're so different. It's that we're so much the same. But then I, yeah, I went down there and I spent about a month with her when she was kind of getting pretty bad. But she was just running around the house like she was totally fine, even though now one of her eyes was starting to kind of swell shut. She was going on horseback rides and she had so many people coming to visit her that she had to, had to turn away people. I mean, she was keeping a, a schedule that would make a healthy person insane. And, uh, you know, two days before she died in her house, having only spent a day or two in the hospital total, uh, she went on a horseback ride with her 83-year-old uh, father. And to me, that was just, that was amazing. And, you know, it made me realize, too, like, I'm like, whatever I go through in the mountains, like, it's nothing compared to what she's going through now, you know? So I was, I had empathy and, and just full understanding of, of how strong she was. Um, yeah, when she died, I mean, she died in her bed with all of us there holding her hand. And, you know, right before she died, she said to me, you know, live your dreams, follow your passions. You have a beautiful life and I'm so proud of you. And, just to end, end it with that honesty and truth and um, her blessing for me to do what I wanted to do. It was like, okay, this is my path. This is what, this is the life I want to live. I, I want to live, and I'm going to do it. And so, um, yeah. After the funeral, I bought a car down in Seattle and. Luckily, I had so many friends who came around just to be with me and help me during that tough time. And I ended up meeting up with a friend in the Canadian Rockies. And we just climbed ice there for two and a half or three weeks. And, you know, this was the year before I I tried the North Buttress of Mount Hunter. And I'd gotten about a third the way up, but, you know, it hadn't gone as well as I'd wanted to. I knew that I had to come back. And so I knew the things I was weak at, you know, still it was, you know, grade six water ice and climbing for days and days on end and just being strong and really, really mentally confident. And so uh, I just worked on all those weaknesses for a full year. And uh, I think I was probably fueled by the positive and negative emotions of losing my mom. But, you know, Canmore and Banff is just one of the most inspiring places I've ever been in my entire life. And I can't think of a more cathartic area to heal and go push yourself and, you know, just expel the negative and, and take in the positive emotions when you're dealing with something like losing your mom. So, uh, yeah, I climbed there for a couple of weeks and just had a really wonderful time and, and really pushed my ice climbing skills and left there feeling super confident. I'm like, all right, I'm as good as any ice pitch on the Moonflower now, I know it. And uh, yeah, drove back up, and before too long, it was time to go back to the Revelations every year, you know, March, that's Revelation time for me. And so I uh, had this good partner, Jason Stuckey from Fairbanks, he flew down and, and we met and flew in, and boy, it was cold. And we tried all these unclimbed peaks and just had a really good trip. And eventually we came away with the first ascent of Apocalypse Peak, which is just this massive, massive mountain in the main spine of the range and just climbed a tremendous ice line. And we got to Bivy and it was really fun. And at the end, you know, we flew out. We'd been in there for like eight days and just ticked off one of the biggest unclimbed peaks in the entire range and we were feeling pretty good. And so now I'm still totally free and I was just starting to kind of feel this flow state and I just said, you know, I got to keep up with this momentum I and mean, I have to keep climbing and being in the Alaska range. And 
I thought for me that the worst thing I could do would be just to sit around in Anchorage and and deal with my emotions there. So I, I turned to the mountains to heal. And a couple days after flying out of the, the Revelations, I got invited on this 10-day ski trip. And so I skied out to the Eldridge with three of my buddies and just had a great time. Like, no pressure. You know, we skied 50 miles out to the road. And it was just a really unique adventure. And then soon after that, I had plans to meet back up with my buddy Kurt, who I'd climbed with in Banff. And um, we knew we wanted to climb Mount Huntington. But, um, you know, we were planning on the Harvard or something like that. And then I really had been enthralled with climbing the Phantom Wall, which again is a route that, although it's just a little bit farther beyond the Harvard route, nobody ever goes and does it. And just two years before, it had received its second ascent by Jared Vilhauer and I believe Tim Dittman. And um, so, yeah, we just went over there and we realized that it's really not that much harder to get there than it was to get to the Harvard route. And so to me, it just seemed like a logical next step. And in a 24-hour or 23-hour day, we round-tripped the third ascent of the Phantom Wall. And again, this is something that you know, two years ago I probably would have thought of as a two- or three-day trip. Um, but now we ticked it off in a long day. And so that was, again, one of those, like, oh, okay, I'm, you know, I wasn't thinking big enough before. I need to keep thinking bigger. And uh, so we... He left after that, and I just decided to bump over to the uh, the Cahilton Glacier, you know. So, <laughs> so now I've pretty much just been living in the mountains for weeks and weeks and weeks. And, um, you know, but I was just infatuated with Mount Hunter. I had climbed it to the summit via the West Ridge two years prior, the year before. Uh, I'd attempted the Moonflower with my buddy Ryan. And... I just, I knew, I, I knew walking into it, I'm like, if I get the conditions and I, and I have a good partnership, I know that we can get up this thing. And, um, but now I was kind of partnerless. And so now I'm trolling around the Hilton Glacier, like it's camp four looking for partners. Hey man, can I climb the moonflower with you? And I ended up meeting up with these two Canadians. And as we're skiing away from camp to go try the, the moonflower on Mount Hunter, I, I go, hey, what are your guys' names again? <laughs> and, and so, uh, yeah, we just ended up having a, a really good time. Um, we had tremendously good weather. Um, you know, a, another team had blazed part of the trail ahead of us. And, yeah, in, <clears throat> we climbed what took 11 hours the year before and eight. And so already I was able to know that, okay, like I'm doing – you know, we're moving way better than last year. Like things are looking good. And, um, yeah, 64 hours after leaving, we arrived on the, on the summit of Mount Hunter. And it was just something that five years ago was so unattainable. Like it wasn't even something that I thought was possible. And after 12 hours of down climbing, the West Ridge and the ramen route, we were back in camp. And I mean, we were utterly fucking wasted. I think we'd slept like a total of five hours and 72 hours. I mean, we were hallucinating. We were, we had trench foot. We were, you know, our clothes were falling off of us, but we had all just climbed the biggest thing of our lives. And, you know, it was, it was amazing, but then I, <laughs> then my buddy Ryan, who I tried the moonflower with the year before, uh, he and I were still psyched. And so we went up and we climbed an ollie. And, you know, we were trying to climb a big route on the south face. And in the end, we pretty much ended up just climbing the west buttress and then we ran out of time. But, you know, 56 days in the mountains. And when I walked out, I had a, a journal that was an inch thick 
you know, with pretty much just psychoanalyzing my entire life and my relationship with my mom. And, and when I look back and read those pages, even today, it's almost hard to read because I, I went to places in my head that I didn't even know existed. And, um, like what? Oh, just like the things we've talked about, like shortcomings with my mom, like how I had not been, you know, how I had failed. And, uh, at the end of it, I just, I walked out feeling really good with everything. And I knew that by doing the hard thing, you know, by admitting my mistakes with her and rebuilding our relationship, I had become stronger. And so that's the, the mindset I try and have. Uh, don't take the easy way. Do the hard way because in the end it's going to be better. It's more rewarding.